Okay, folks, it is 8 a.m. Thursday morning here in the Philippines, and uh, I see that we do have uh, several online on Facebook, and some have joined on Zoom. The message I sent yesterday, I had put the wrong dates in there when I set up the meeting, and I noticed it this morning when I tried to open up my setup for a meeting and said, you don't have a meeting. So I quickly, about 20 minutes ago, was able to send a new message out with a new link. So uh, it looks like some have gotten the message and we'll pray that others will see that and will be able to join us in our study. Well, today, uh, this evening, for you in uh, the Western Hemisphere, we will begin a new lesson in our Necessary Knowledge for Christian Living entitled Ambassadorship is Our Commission. That's that's what we are to be. We are to be ambassadors for the Lord Jesus Christ in this lost world. So with that, I pray you prepared your hearts for the study of God's word through confession of sin if necessary. And uh, let's uh, take care of that if you haven't, as we offer a few minutes of silent prayer before we begin our study. Let's pray. Father, again, you've given us life today, and we thank you for that grace. And we've chosen to use this portion of this day, whether the morning here in this side of the world or the evening in the Western Hemisphere, to feed on your word, to spend time in your word of God, to allow the Holy Spirit to teach us truths that we do not yet know, uh, clarify some things that we thought we knew, whatever it may be. Uh, I've been chosen by you to be the mouthpiece, but the Holy Spirit is really the teacher. And so only he knows uh, the status, our, our growth status for each and every one of us, and only he can teach us at the level of which we're able to understand. So we'll feed on your word as we begin tonight. Uh, be with us uh, for this 75 minutes, and may we do this for your honor and glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay, um, ambassadorship, our commission. Uh, we cannot be properly motivated to lead others to Christ until we understand God's love toward us. In Romans 5, as we've just finished Romans 5, and we'll begin Romans 6. Uh, well, we're, we're in Romans 5 this next Sunday, I guess, and Romans 6 will follow. Um, but in Romans 5, we Paul writes about the love of Christ, uh, God's love toward us, I should say. Though we are ungodly, though we were totally helpless, though we were hostile to and enemies of the Creator, yet God demonstrates His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 2 Corinthians 5.14, for the love of Christ controls us. This love of God for us is the only force that can motivate us to fulfill our commission. And I, rather than the control, I prefer to use the word motivate uh, to direct or guide. Because quite honestly, uh, control is when I'm uh, using my joystick, playing a game, and I'm controlling what happens on the screen. Uh, the Holy Spirit doesn't control us to that level, but the control the Holy Spirit, the love of Christ, as Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5.14, should motivate us to fulfill our commission. The love of Christ is not love for him that we produce. It is God's undying, eternal, infinite love for us, manifested to us, through the Lord Jesus Christ, and produced in us when we walk in the sphere of the Spirit, when we function yielded to God the Holy Spirit in our life. In Romans 5.5, 5, we read, And hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. And then in Galatians 5.22 and 23, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, 
joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. So when Paul says that the love controls us, he uses the Greek word syneko. Soon means together. Eko means to have and to hold, to possess and to control. The word can be translated hold together or constrain or press on on every side, urge or impel. Those are all words that we could use in translating this word syneko. In this case, it carries the idea of someone possessing something and controlling it for his benefit. In this case, it is God's love that possesses and holds us together, motivating us continually upward in spiritual growth for our good and for his glory. This driving force is available to every one of us, but not until we begin to understand it through the study of the word will it be activated in our lives. <clears throat> As we study, we see Jesus Christ more clearly. We understand with progressively more depth and intimacy what it took for Jesus to lay aside the riches of eternity and step in the flesh into time. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 8 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. For us, the awesome God emptied himself and came in the form of human flesh to live the life of a bondservant. For over 33 years, he humbled himself, taking one step down after another, after another, until the final humiliation of death on a cross. According to Philippians 2, 5 to 8, Paul writes, Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he, that is Jesus Christ, existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped a thing to be held on to. But he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. He did it all. He, that is Jesus Christ, did it all to bring us, you and I, the love that provides eternal life. This is the love that holds us together. The more impressed we are with it, the more clearly we will see how empty are the things of time that we once so eagerly sought. We will find ourselves like the Apostle Peter in John chapter 6 with only one real option. As we read in Verses 65 to 68 in John 6. And he, that is Jesus, was saying, For this reason I have said to you, that no one can come to me unless it has been granted him from the Father. As a result of this, as a result of Jesus saying these things, many of the disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. Now, disciples, remember, uh, sometimes we see the word disciples, it means those 12 that followed with Jesus everywhere he went that are listed by name. But everyone, the masses of that would, would follow Jesus, they were considered disciples as well. And so this verse is saying, as Jesus was saying to all of them, not just his 12, but to all of those people who were following along with him, the Romans called the way. We have no idea. We do know that at one point, he fed about 5,000 of them. Another point, he fed about 3,000 of them. And so he had hundreds, thousands following him as he was making his way uh, around uh, Israel. And so he said to them in verse 65, 
For this reason I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted him from the Father. And as a result of his saying that, many of those that followed withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. So Jesus said to the twelve, his twelve that remained, you do not want to go away also, do you? Simon Peter spoke up and answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have words of eternal life. So here at a time when many of his disciples turned away from following him, the Lord asked Peter and the others if he too were going to leave. But where else could Peter go? He knew no one but Jesus and nothing but the plan of God would ever be able to satisfy the longings of his soul. The love of Christ had taken hold of Peter. In 2 Corinthians 5, Paul writes in verses 14 and 15, for the love of Christ controls us. Again, uh, we just read it and here it is. It means hold us together. Having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he, Jesus, died for all, that they who live, you, each one of us, those for whom he died, those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on our behalf. So when Paul tells the Corinthians that one died for all, the one he's talking about is Adam. The entire human race was thrown into sin with the fall of Adam. When he fell, Adam died spiritually. Genesis 2.17 But from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in that day you shall you eat from it, you shall surely die. There God is instructing Adam, and we trust he told Eve, regarding that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, giving them the freedom. He established freedom right here. All right. You are free to eat. And then verse 16, you are free to eat from any of the trees in the garden. But, verse 17, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day you eat from it, you shall surely die. Now we know that dying there in our study in the past, it really says the, the Hebrew word for die is mut. And when you look at the Hebrew of that verse, mut appears twice. So basically, we should interpret this as saying, dying, you shall surely die. And so we know that at the moment Adam and Eve disobeyed God by eating from that tree, they died spiritually. The children of Adam and Eve were born, that's you and I, every child comes from Adam and Eve, and the children of Adam and Eve because they were fallen, those children, you and I, every child who is born, is born in the likeness of their fallen parents. We're not all created in the image of God. The only humans created in the image of God were Adam and Eve. Now, I believe that you and I as Christians, and this is what's unique about Christianity, all right? Nowhere in all of scripture until we get to the Apostle Paul do we find out that our function, that we become like Christ, we are to become like Christ, Romans 8, 29, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son. Now that's from the Apostle Paul in Romans, and that regards you and I as Christians. So only in all of human history was that unique aspect given and required of you and I, and that is Christians. So I and we and we're also told by Paul that once we when we the moment that we uh, yield to God the Holy Spirit, the moment that I, let me back up the moment that we trust in the person and his work on the cross for our salvation. At that moment, we are told that the Holy Spirit indwells us and Christ indwells us and the Father indwells us. And so 
with that, I would say that besides Adam and Eve being perfect, being created in the image of God, I would say that you and I as Christians, that does now apply. We are to become the image of Jesus Christ. People should see the life of Jesus Christ in our life. And that was never true with anyone prior to Christianity, prior, prior to the Apostle Paul. And so I would say that if we're going to talk about someone today being, being created in the image of God, that creation only occurs in this time when someone truly trusts in the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. And at that point, I would say that they are now, because we're a new creation. We'll get to that passage also. We are a new creation in Christ. And so I said, I believe that that phrase, and we hear it often, don't forget, we're all created in the image of God. No, not all human beings were created in the image of God. Adam and Eve, yes, until they fell. But every person born through the lines of Adam and Eve all the way down throughout all of human history, the only ones that we could say are, are reborn, that's, that's regeneration. Our spirit comes back to life and the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ and the Father take up possession or uh, living in us, that I would say that we are created. Christians are created in the image of God. And we are to become like Christ in that relationship. So, for God so loved the world, here it is, the child of Adam and Eve were born in the likeness of their parents. They and their children were all born spiritually dead separated from God, but because of his love, God sent his only begotten son into the world of death and darkness. And it's true, John 3, 16 is true, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life, all right? Now remember, Jesus is still alive when he speaks these words in John three sixteen, And the audience to whom he was speaking were Jews, and so the statement that he was making in John 3, 16 to them is that if they would believe that he was that only begotten son, that he was the promised Messiah, they would not perish and they would have eternal life. And that means they would be present in the kingdom. Remember, there was no knowledge of Christianity at this point when, when, John, when Jesus spoke these words. Now, Christianity had it happened. John... The Apostle John, who wrote these this, this gospel, yes, he wrote it after Christianity had begun. But remember, in context, John 3.16, Jesus Christ is alive, walking on the earth at this point, speaking to the Jews. Jesus Christ came to die for every member of the human race. He did so with a goal in mind, that they who lived should no longer live for themselves. The phrase, they who live, refers to all who by faith in Jesus Christ come out of spiritual death into life. Life is Zoe, the word used in John 1.4. In him was life, and the life was the light of men to describe the essence of life, which is found only in the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ took our place on the cross so that we could take his place in the world. He was imputed with our sins so that we could be imputed with his righteousness. He died for us so that we could live for him. If we are living for ourselves, following our own plans, seeking our own desires, then we are not fulfilling the purpose for which Christ came into this world. He died so that we who live should no longer live for ourselves, but for him. And Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5, 16 and 17, Therefore, from now on, 
we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. When we stop living only for ourselves and start living for Christ, we begin to look at other people differently. Before, we saw others only according to the flesh, from human perspective. We were interested in other people for what we could get out of them or for how they made us feel. But now, we know that God wants us to look at others with his eyes. He wants us to see in every unbeliever what he sees, someone precious enough for Christ to die for, and therefore, someone who has the potential of became, becoming a new creation in Christ Jesus. Paul is saying that if we are driven by the love of Christ and can no longer live simply for our own pleasures and purposes, then we are no longer able to look at other people superficially. We have to look at people as potential believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. We have to see in them the infinite worth that God vested in them when he sacrificed his own son. Therefore, our attitude to other members of the human race is completely transformed from human viewpoint, which sees only the surface, to divine viewpoint, which sees all the potential. Our perception of other people is able to change because of the profound change that has taken place in us. Paul says that in Christ, we are to a totally new creation. At the moment of our salvation, the Holy Spirit placed us in Christ and we became new. In the twinkling of an eye, he gave us new position, new life, new power, new purpose, new destiny. The old things passed away and new things have come. 2 Corinthians 5.17 does not say that if any man is in Christ, he ought to become a new creation and old things ought to pass away. It does not say that if any man is in Christ, he feels like a cr new creation or he acts like a new creation. It does not say that old things will eventually pass away and new things will eventually come. It says, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation, and the old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. These are statements of absolute accomplished fact. They refer to positional reality. He died for us so that we could live for him. At the very moment we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit instantaneously performs five irrevocable works in us. Let's consider those five works of the Holy Spirit. First, we have a new position, baptism. By the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we are placed in Christ, becoming a part of his body, spiritual body forever. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 for by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. This gives us a new position spiritually. Before we believed, we were dead in Adam. Now we are alive in Christ. We have been identified with Christ in his death, in his burial, and in his resurrection according to Romans 6, 3 and 4, where we read, or do you not know that all of us have been baptized? Baptizo means identified. So all of us have been baptized, identified into Christ Jesus. Those of us who have been baptized, have been identified into Christ Jesus, have been identified, baptized into his death. Therefore, we have been buried with him through identification into his death, in order that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, 
so too, so we too might walk in newness of life. Many, 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 many theologian pastors and churches for centuries have used this verse to indicate water baptism. And this is the verse that they'll read when they're sprinkling water on the head of the infants or when they're baptizing them uh, in water or whatever. Uh, they'll use these verses talking about being baptized. Baptized, baptizo in these verses have nothing to do with water. They are baptism with and by the Holy Spirit. We have been buried with him through baptism into death. So these verses identify as us, us with his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And then Paul goes on in Ephesians 2, 6, and 7. And we there we read that we have been raised up with him, and we as Christians have been seated with him in heaven. Ephesians 2, 6, and 7. Paul says, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus in order that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So we've been, so that's our identification truths. We've been identified with Christ in his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, and his session. Those five things make up the definition of when we use the phrase, we are identified in Christ. Identified in his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, and his session. Colossians 1, or I'm sorry, Colossians 3, verses 1 to 4. If then you have been raised up with Christ, Paul writes, keep seeking the things above, and you have, by the way. If, and you have, if is the first class condition, if, and it is true, that you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things on the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. So this, this diagram here shows the baptism by the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 15, 22. For as in Adam all die, and that's where we are, when we are born, we are condemned in Adam. But it goes on to say that once you've placed your faith in the person and his work on the cross, his deaths, burial, and resurrection, in Christ all will be made alive, the last part of verse 22. And then we see in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, for by one spirit we are all baptized into one body, identified into one body, the body of Christ, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit, the one Holy Spirit. So there you see the pictorial diagram of what we call the baptism by the Holy Spirit. And this is, this is positional truth. All right? At the cross, that's where we Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. 1 Corinthians 1.18. So at the moment you place your faith in the person and work of Christ, you are saved. You are in Christ, as we just read in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he, that person in Christ, is a new creation. All things, old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. And then we saw 1 Corinthians 15, 22. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all be made alive. This is what we call positional truth. What does it mean? We were taken out of Adam. There's the picture. We were taken out of Adam and placed into Christ. We have a new position. When we were born, we were positioned in Adam. Now that we've placed our trust in Christ and we've become a Christian, we are in a new position, all right? Positional truth. And so we are identified, as we saw in, in Romans 6, 
identified with Christ's death, his burial, his resurrection. And then in Ephesians, Paul goes on to say, identified in Christ's ascension and his session. And of course, Romans 8.1 makes it clear, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So see, these, these verses highlight this whole concept of being in Christ. That's our new position. And you can never come out of it. You are there permanently in Christ. Regarding of what you do, whether you never attend church, if you have trusted in Christ and his work on the cross, the payment for your sins as your only means of salvation, you are saved for all eternity, regardless of what you do. You can't undo, cannot undo what Christ did for you after you have placed your trust in that work for your eternal salvation. Next, we have regeneration, the second work of the Holy Spirit. Regeneration gives us new life. Regeneration is the work by which God, the Holy Spirit, brings our dead human spirit to life, making a spiritual life. Remember, we've said before in previous lessons not too long ago, that in Adam, God saw every one of us in Adam, all right? And he saw every one of us perfect in Adam. Before Adam fell, he was perfect, had a perfect body, a perfect soul, and a perfect spirit, a living spirit. And we were seen by God in Adam in that same condition. But when Adam fell, when Adam disobeyed God, his spirit died. And at that very same moment, our spirit died. So when we were born, I use myself for an example, August 25, 1946, Daryl Anderson became a living, breathing human being. And at that very moment, at that very moment, God imputed into my sin nature, because I was born with one, just like all of us, God imputed to my sin nature Adam's original sin. And I was born with a physical body, a soul, but my spirit was dead because my spirit had died way back when Adam disobeyed God and his spirit died, my spirit died. So regeneration is the work by which God, the Holy Spirit, brings our dead human spirit to life. That's regeneration. Making us spiritually alive. Now, that means being spiritually alive, we can now have a, a relationship with a spiritual God. Titus 3, 5 is our verse. He, God, saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration, and renewing by the Holy Spirit. We are born again, this time as children of God. We are born again, our spirit. Jesus said um, in John 3, 7, we'll get to it. So let's read some verses as we get to there. Ephesians 2, 4 to 6. But God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 2, 4 to 6. Peter writes in 1 Peter 1, 23, For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable, that is, through the living and abiding word of God. And Christ, Jesus Christ told Nicodemus in John 3, verses 3 to 7, Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born again, can he? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water, that means you have to be born as a human being, and born of the Spirit. He cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. When we, be, when we came out of our mother's womb, we were born of flesh and we were flesh. 
and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So when we when we are born physically, we become a breathing, living, breathing human being. We are born of flesh and we are flesh. But when we have placed our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and his work for us on the cross as our only means of salvation, then we are born of the spirit. The Holy Spirit brings our dead human spirit to life. Do not marvel at this, Jesus said. You must be born again. Whereas before we were physically alive, but spiritually dead. John 5, 21, where just as the father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the son also gives life to those whom he wishes. Now we are spiritually alive. In Christ. And positionally dead to the flesh. Romans 6, 11, even so consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but consider yourself to be alive to God in Christ Jesus. Then 1 John 5, 12, he who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. And the life spoken of here is eternal life that has been imputed to us. According to Colossians 1, 13, where he delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. We have been transferred from the domain of darkness, being lost, to the kingdom of light, becoming saved. Here we have another diagram to explain what this means, the regeneration. We were born with a body infected with the sin nature and a soul. According to Titus 3, 5, he saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. So, the moment we placed our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit brought our human spirit to life. Now we have a living human spirit, and so what is able to be happening then is we will be indwelt by the Holy Spirit. That is the third work of the Spirit. We have new power. At the moment of salvation, we are permanently indwelt by God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 9 to 11. However, Paul writes, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. And if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet spirit is, the spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit, which who indwells you. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit supplies us with the ability to access the new man in us. Yielding to the Holy Spirit makes possible the filling with the character of Christ, which is really what Ephesians 5.18 really means. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation. But be filled in the sphere of the Spirit. And what are we to be filled with? With the character of Christ. For us to be filled, Jesus Christ is going to fill us with his character when we are living in the sphere of the Spirit. Now, for years we were taught that if, if we are yielded to God the Holy Spirit, or what does he say? And do not get drunk with wine for this is a but be filled in the sphere of the Spirit. And we were taught that in 1 John 1, 9, if you confess all your sin, you'll be immediately filled with the Holy Spirit and be spiritual. That's not true. That's not true. Because when you read 5.18 that way, it looks like the Spirit is the content of the filling. But when we go to Ephesians 3.19, 
3.19 tells us that Paul is praying that we will be filled with the character of God. That's the content of the filling. We are, we are be, become more and more like God in our character, in what we think, say, and do. That's the process of spiritual growth. And so Ephesians 3.19 tells us the content of the filling, and that is the character of God. And then in, in Ephesians 4.10, 4, it tells us that it's Christ who's going to fill all in all. So Jesus is the one responsible to see that the filling takes place. So what's our responsibility? According to Ephesians 5.18, we must be functioning. We must be living in the sphere of the Spirit, yielded to God the Holy Spirit, Romans 6.13. 6, and when we are yielded to God the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ will, be, will, will make certain that we are filled with the character of God. And how do we do that? By studying the Bible. Where do we find the character of God? In God's word. And if we don't spend time in God's word, you'll never, never be filled with the character of Christ, the character of God. It can't happen because the Bible is where we find that character. So yielding to God, the Holy Spirit makes possible the filling with the character of Christ. Before salvation, our only source of motivation and power was the old sin nature. But now, not only is the power of the old sin nature broken, but we are able to draw on the omnipotence of God. John 7, 37 to 39. Now, in the last days, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If any man is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture says, from his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. But the Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. And then in John 14, 17 to 20, that in the Spirit of truth, that is the Spirit of truth, he's talking about with his disciples in the upper room. He's speaking to his disciples, Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not believe, behold him or know him. It said, but you know him because he abides with you and he will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. After a little while, the world will behold me no more, but you will behold me because I live. You shall live also. In that day, you shall know that I am in my father and you are in me and I in you. And then in John 17, 26, and I have made thy name known to them and will make it known that the love wherewith thou didst love me may be in them and I in them. That's Jesus in his prayer to the Father in the Garden of Gethsemane. Now I want to back up to these three passages that we find in John 7 and John 14 and John 17. We have used... In Years passed, and I was guilty of it. I was guilty of it because I was taught it, and I believed my teachers. I didn't know any better. I was learning from the teachers, and as we're learning, we believe that the things our teachers are telling us is the truth, and only as we grow are we able to look back and think, well, that, yes, my teacher taught me great things, but there were some areas that we're not really correct. Please remember, none of our teachers, not a single one of our teachers, whoever has taught you in the past, not one of them was perfect. Not one of them knew everything was correct. In fact, many of them that go all the way back to, to Lewis Perry Schaefer and before him, as he established the Dallas Theological Seminary, there are, there are errors in his writing that, that at that point he said what he thought was the truth, but he died before he learned that some of what he thought and wrote was not really true. He had misinterpreted. He had misunderstood. But he died before he learned all the truth. And every one of those people through all these years have all died 
before they knew all the truth that there was to be known. And so we need to understand that. So let me explain John 7, 14 and, and 17 here. All right. Remember, there was no knowledge of Christianity at all. I don't believe Jesus, as he walked as a man on this earth, remember, he set aside his omniscience, he set aside his omnip omnipotence, he set aside his omnipresence. And so the only thing that he knew that was spiritual was whatever the Holy Spirit revealed to him. And I don't believe that, that Jesus even knew that there was going to be Christianity that where we are today. And so when he was speaking to his disciples about this spirit that was going to come and, uh, and about what he that spirit would do and, and so on and teach them. And all of these verses, what he had in mind was the kingdom. Remember, he had come as the Messiah with the gospel, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Well, they crucified him. So that kingdom has been delayed. But all of the passages we read in the, in the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, none of those passages relate directly to you or I, you and I as Christians. They were all having to do with the Jews and what would come. Because you can go back in the Old Testament, Ezekiel and Jeremiah, and you see that they will be indwelt. They will be permanently indwelt with the Holy Spirit in the kingdom. They knew nothing, had no knowledge of Christianity as we have it today. So we move to 1 Corinthians 6.19. All right. 1 Corinthians 6.19. Now, here we have Paul. Paul has been given the mystery. That's why it was a mystery. Nobody, no prophets, Jesus, nobody knew of the mystery that Jesus himself in his glorified, the glorified Jesus, remember. Not Jesus as he was in his humanity, but the glorified Jesus appeared to Paul and taught him these things called the mystery. And no one before he explained it to Paul had any knowledge, even him as when he walked as a human being. So first, first Corinthians 6, 19. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and that you are not your own? So we've looked at this diagram. Baptism with the Holy Spirit is what we're going to look at now. We saw in Titus that our human spirit came back to life. So now, as baptism of the Holy Spirit, at that same moment, at the same instant, we delayed this diagram as we talked about this indwelling. But here's the picture of that indwelling. The moment our human spirit comes to life, Jesus Christ will baptize, identify each and every one of us with the indwelling Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit takes up permanent residence and that work is done by Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ baptizes each and every one of us at the moment of our salvation with the permanent dwelling of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and that you are not your own? Number four of the five works of the Spirit is gifting. Gives us a new purpose in life. At salvation, the Holy Spirit gives each of us a unique spiritual gift and a unique work to accomplish. Now, I've talked about spiritual gifts in the past, and here we're going to look at the four major passages where we get, we find those spiritual gifts. But we're just going to identify them now. Spiritual gifts is a is a major session I have coming up and we'll get to each and every one of the gifts and we'll talk about what they do, what they're for, what what their purpose is and who has them and et cetera, et cetera, all about them. 
But here's the passages where we find the gifts. 1 Corinthians 12, 7 to 11. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, and to another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit, and to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit. And to another the effecting of miracles, and to another prophecy, and to another the distinguishing of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually, just as he wills. Then we move farther down in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, down to verse 28, 29, and 30. We find some more gifts. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, various kinds of tongues. And then verse 29. Are all are not apostles, are they? All are not prophets, are they? All are not teachers, are they? All are not workers of miracles, are they? All do not have gifts of healing, do they? All do not speak with tongues, do they? And do not, all do not interpret, do they? Then we go to the next verse, Ephesians 4.11. And he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers. For four gifts listed there. Some people say five. We'll understand that later on when we cover these things in detail. Romans 12, 6 to 8 is the fourth verse. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, Paul writes, each of us is to exercise them, the gifts, accordingly. If prophecy, according to the proportion of his faith. If service, in his serving. Or he who teaches, in his teaching. Or he who exhorts, in his exhortation. He who gives with liberality. He who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Now, from these four passages that we just read, we discover 20 spiritual gifts. Ten of the gifts were temporary, meaning they functioned only from AD 30 to AD 96. Some of them even ended earlier than AD 96, as we'll see. The ten spiritual gifts that no longer function are apostle, prophet, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, miracles, healing, discerning of spirits, faith, speaking in tongues, and interpretation of tongues. These gifts no longer exist. All right. The tongues gift ceased in AD 70 when God destroyed Jerusalem and the temple, scattering the Jews throughout the world to this day. By AD 96, all temporary gifts ceased to function. Ten of the gifts were and are permanent, continuing to function in the spiritual body of Christ today. The spiritual gifts that function in the spiritual body of Christ today are pastor, teacher, evangelism, evangelist, teacher, exhortation, helps, mercy, giving, ministry, administration, and leadership. The purpose of our spiritual gift is to manifest the power of the Spirit of God. Here, I, I put the gifts here. There we go. The purpose of this spiritual gift is to manifest the power of the Spirit of God within us by edifying the body of Christ in some way. Edifying means building up the body of Christ. The work chosen by God for us is something that no one else could ever accomplish. And that will remain undone for eternity if we do not do it. Only in the exercise of our gift in the work of God has chosen, that God has chosen, we fulfill the plan of God for our life and achieve the eternal greatness for which we were designed. A new purpose. And like I said, we will uh, deal with spiritual gifts in detail in a future lesson. So number five of the five works of the Holy Spirit, sealing, giving us a new destiny. Sealing is the work by which the Holy Spirit assures our eternal destiny. As we read in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, in him, that's in Christ, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise who is given as a pledge of our inheritance 
with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of his glory. And then in Ephesians 4.30, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. In ancient times, the seal signified three things, ownership, security, and safe delivery. In Romans 15, 28, therefore, when I've finished this and have put my seal on the fruit of theirs, I will go on my way to Spain. Paul in this verse applies all three ideas as he puts his seal on the money collected in Asia for the saints in Jerusalem. The money would be identified, kept secure, and delivered safely to its ultimate destination. In the same way, every believer is marked as God's private and precious possession with God's own guarantee of safe delivery. The changes noted thus far are only a part of the 51 things. These five things that work, just part of the 51 things that happen to a person the moment he or she replaces their trust in Christ for their salvation. Doctrine, doctrine of baptism. We've talked about bapti being baptized into Christ. So let's consider the doctrine of baptism. Hebrews 5, 11 to chapter 6, verse 3. Concerning him, we have much to say, and it's hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God, and have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. Chapter 6, 1 to 3, Therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of instruction about washings, that's baptisms, and laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. So beginning in verse 11 of chapter, uh, to chapter 6, verse 3, the believers in the first century Jerusalem were called down for their failure to mature in the faith. These believers who ought to by now have been teachers were still babes in Christ who needed someone to teach them the basics of the word of God. The apostle Paul urges these Jews in Jerusalem to get past the elementary teachings and to press on to maturity. He then lists seven foundational doctrines that believers must understand if they are ever to ho ever hope to reach spiritual maturity. One of these is the doctrine of baptism. The usage of the Greek word baptizo can be traced as far back as the ninth century BC. The word had two basic meanings, to change the nature of something and to identify something with its purpose. The first meaning was employed by Homer in his great writing, The Odyssey, used there to describe the tempering of a sword. When the hot metal was plunged into water, the sword was baptized and changed from soft to hard metal. The second meaning was used by the Spartans who would baptize, identify their spears before a battle by dipping them in blood. The process did not change the physical characteristics of the weapon, but served as a picture of it becoming a battle spear, one that had tasted blood. We find nine baptisms, nine different baptisms taught in the New Testament. Five of these nine are non-water baptisms. 
No water involved whatsoever. These baptisms are considered real baptisms, which means that a real change does take place as it did with the sword. The hot metal of that sword, they've been beating it into the shape of the sword with the with the fire and the and the anvil and the hammer. And once they've got it in the shape that they want it, they plunge it into water. And the sword immediately became changed from soft to hard metal. That's that's the real baptism. And a real baptism, meaning a real change takes place, is the non-water baptism, five of the nine. Four of these nine are water baptisms, considered ritual. Water is included, used in the baptism, but it's a ritual baptism, meaning there is no change. No change takes place, but something is simply identified with its purpose. So let's big, dig in. Five non-water or real baptisms where a real change does take place. First, we have the baptism of Moses. We read about it in 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 and 2. For I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Now, someone says, well, Daryl, there's water in the sea. Yeah, read on. In the baptism of Moses, Moses identified is identified with a cloud and the children of Israel are identified with Moses. The cloud is Jesus Christ. The people of the Exodus generation passed through the Red Sea from slavery to freedom, and no one got wet. But an actual change did really take place. And what was it? 2.5 million slaves were identified with God's deliverer, Moses, and those 2.5 million slaves became free men. Their lives changed. No water being identified with Moses with the cloud and through the sea. Next, we have the baptism of the cross, also called the baptism of the cup. We find it spoken of in Luke 12, verse 50. Jesus speaking, but I have a baptism to undergo and how distressed I am until it is accomplished. And then in Matthew 20, verses 20 to 23, then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came to Jesus with her sons, bowing down and making a request to him. And Jesus said to her, what do you, re what do you wish? She, the mother of the sons of Zebedee, said to him, command that in your kingdom, these two sons of mine may sit one at your right and one at your left. But Jesus answered in verse 22, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink? They said to him, we are able. That would be the, the sons of Zebedee. They, were, they responded, we are able. And he said to them, my cup you shall drink. But to sit at my right hand and on my left, that is not mine to give. But it is for those for whom he has it has been prepared by my father. So in the baptism of the cross or the cup, when the, and the, that's what it was referred to as actually what was going to happen on the, on the cross. But in the one passage, uh, it's talked about the cup to drink. When the sins of all men on the cross, the sins of all men were poured out on Jesus. The God man was changed. He became sin. Okay. All right, let me look where I am here. Yeah, Second Corinthians 5.21. He, God the Father, made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteous of God in him. On the cross, when Jesus was identified with our sins, he was under condemnation, separated from God, the Father, and separated from God, the Holy Spirit. As we read in Matthew 27, 46, 
And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? One of the results of the baptism of the cross or the cup is the believers is that the believer's life is healed by his wounds. First Peter 2, 24. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, that we might die to sin and live to righteous for to righteousness, for by his wounds you were healed. The healing here is spiritual, my friends. A lot of people think when we take this verse, well, I'm I'm sick, I've got cancer, whatever, and and uh, God's going to heal that cancer. The healing here that took place in each of our lives was we changed from being spiritually lost to having eternal life. So the wounds, the wound that we have is separation from God being born, condemned. And by what Christ did on the cross, then we can become spiritually alive by faith in him. Number three, baptism of the believer by the Holy Spirit into Jesus. And we looked at the diagrams about this. This is one of those two baptisms that are related to the Holy Spirit. The change that takes place is that at the moment of salvation, the believer is baptized by the Holy Spirit by changing him from being identified in Adam to being identified in Christ. And of course, we saw this diagram earlier. Whereas in Adam all die, so also in Christ all be made alive. And so uh, there's our passages regarding that positional change. And we are baptized by the Holy Spirit into Jesus. So that's one of the two baptisms of the believer. One by the Holy Spirit into Jesus. That's this one here. And the next one is baptism of the church age, the Christian. I'm going to gonna change these words from the church age to the age of grace and the word believer to, to Christian trying to do that as I continue in my preparation of lessons. Uh, but anyway, uh, the real, uh, this one is from 1 Corinthians 15, 22, or I'm sorry, Matthew 3, 11. Baptism of the believer by Jesus with the Holy Spirit. John the Baptist for prophesied when he said, as for me, I baptize you with water for repentance. He, referring to Jesus, who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And then we read in Acts 1, 4 to 8. I gather him together. He, Jesus, now them is his disciples. Gathering his disciples together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, you heard of from me. For John baptized with water, and you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you were restoring the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or epochs which the Father has fixed in his own authority. But you will receive, in verse 8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you should be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even in the remotest part of the earth. This is the second of two baptisms that are related to the Holy Spirit. This change that takes place is that at the moment of salvation, Jesus Christ baptizes the believer with the Holy Spirit by placing the Holy Spirit inside his human spirit, okay? He was, he was talking about the coming baptism, all right? And here we have the picture, all right? And dwelt with the Holy Spirit. Now, that is only true of Christians. Now, when we go back to the passage in uh, Matthew 3.11 and Acts 8, and I should have, should have caught this earlier so I could have included it 
in the notes. Remember, Jesus had no, no knowledge of Christianity. All right. So two things happened. The baptism of the Holy Spirit that happened to the disciples that he was speaking to in Matthew 3.11 and Acts 1, 4 to 8. Okay. That happened to those disciples on Pentecost. Acts 2, verses, verse 4. They were filled with the Spirit. All right. That gave them supernatural power, but that filling with the Spirit was not the permanent indwelling of the Spirit. And we'll see that as we as we get into more speaking about the Spirit and the spiritual gifts. But that filling in Acts 2, 4, for those disciples, those followers of Jesus in the upper room, that was temporary. That was that was the filling which is temporary, but it gave them the supernatural power to do the miracles that they did. Now, the permanent dwelling that will happen to the Jews, it will happen to these, these disciples of Jesus, but that permanent dwelling will not happen until the kingdom. Now, it's possible that Peter may have become a Christian before he died, and becoming a Christian, he may have been permanently indwelt. It's possible that John, having lived so many years, almost to the end of the first century, and having plenty of time to have read and understood the grace gospel of Paul, salvation gospel there, even John may have become a Christian. But of all the disciples, there are the only two that I think truly became Christian and would have been permanently indwelt. And so this permanent indwelling that will take place here that we're showing this diagram, this is for Christians only since the Apostle Paul. He would have been the first one that was permanently indwelt with the Holy Spirit. And then five, we've got three minutes to finish this one, and then we'll pick up where we left off next week. Baptism of fire. Man, Matthew 3.11 again. For As for me, John the Baptist, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he is coming after me mightier than I, and I'm not fit to remove his sandals, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And then Luke 3.16, John answered and said to them all, that's John the Baptist, as for me, I baptize you with water, but one is coming who is mightier than I, and I'm not fit to untie the thong, untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you, that's referring to Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and fire. In the yet future baptism of fire, all believers will be identified with the fire of judgment. All unbelievers will be identified with the fire of judgment. A permanent change will take place at the second advent when unbelievers are removed from the earth and sent to eternal destruction. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7-9, and to give Relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And these will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Revelation 14 chapter 14 through 19, and we'll not read all those chapters. I don't have time. The baptism of fire for unbelieving Jews is the focus of the following passages for the Jews. And um, I'll not read all the passages. You have them in your notes, and you can look them up on your own. But one of the passages is Ezekiel 20, for the Jews now, verses 34 to 38. Jesus is saying, I will bring you out from the peoples and gather you from the lands where you are scattered with a mighty hand, with an outstretched arm, and with wrath poured out. And I'll bring you into the wilderness of the people. So, so Ezekiel is prophesying uh, that they will be brought up and brought into the kingdom. Another passage is Isaiah 1, 25 to 27. And Malachi 3, I see we're we're going to run out of passages here. So here's what I'm going to do. We're going to stop right here. We'll pick up with this final non-water baptism. Okay. And uh, then we'll move on to the other baptisms 
and probably on into our next lesson next week. So it's 7654 down to the last second. So let's pray. Father, again, thank you for this time together. It's so exciting as we spend time in your word. And I just pray that those who are studying along with us uh, are as excited about it as, as I am to be used as the teacher. Uh, your word is so powerful, Father. And if we can only understand that that's the food for our spiritual lives, that's the food. Singing songs, listening to Christian songs, that's not going to grow. We can't grow listening to songs and singing songs. We can only grow by feeding on your word. So thank you for this time together. We pray that we'll take these words and, and live out the truths that we understand for your honor and for your glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, everybody. And until next, well, I'll we'll be back again on Sunday.